Okay, thanks. So as promised, we've gone from the general to the more and more particular. And what I was doing in this paper was to try to make a case for the need to extend the dialogue between Marxist and feminist approaches to international political economy. And I started my paper, uh, I opened it with a quote that comes from Ernst & Young, which is a large professional service <laughs> at a county firm. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, so they've written this document that's called Groundbreakers, Using the Strength of Women to Rebuild the World Economy. And at some point within this document, they write, it's time to place renewed emphasis on women as a resource to move businesses and economies ahead. The learning that comes from a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And I start with this, with this quote because I think it encapsulates the problematic with which this paper and my work right now is concerned, which has to do with this growing coalition of what I call transnational business feminism. And what I mean by this is I'm referring to a growing coalition that consists of liberal feminists, of states, of the regional and international funding institutions, so World Bank, uh, IMF, the usual suspects here, uh, as well with the growing number of corporations, and particularly financial firms, as well as some academics, NGOs, and others who have really converged on this need to promote gender equality in the global north as well as in the global south. And this coalition finds its ideological basis in what feminists have called the business case for gender equality. And the argument here is that by investing in women, which is generally meant increasing women's access to jobs in the so-called formal sector, uh, by improving the availability of credit for women entrepreneurs, and by investing in women's human capital, will improve not just uh, women's empowerment, but will improve economies more broadly, and, uh, and, and ultimately this is good for business. So this coalition is arguing that investing in women is what they're calling smart economics. Everyone benefits from this. And what I'm particularly concerned with here are the ways in which financial firms and other accounting firms, Ernst & Young, uh, Goldman Sachs, Deloitte, all of these firms are actually participating in the construction of a very particular knowledge about gender. And they're constructing a knowledge about gender that actually empties gender of its meaning uh, it, it, it empties the meaning of gender, of politics, of power, of history, and it presents women and gender equality as key to the reproduction and the re-embedding of capitalism post-2008 global financial crisis. So what I argue in this paper is that in the wake of the financial crisis, we've seen a, a bunch of Marxist IP scholarship that wants to explain the global financial crisis and wants to articulate progressive means forward post-crisis. But most of this literature has remained silent on questions of gender. And I argue that this is not the case for mainstream scholarship, but actually in the mainstream scholarship and discourse, gender has become an important terrain of debate regarding the causes of and the ways out of the current economic crisis. So I think what this paper is trying to do is in some ways start to answer the question that Sandra raised at the very beginning, which is why return to this debate between Marxism and feminism now? Why is it of paramount importance? And one of the things that I'm trying to say is that it's of paramount importance because what we're seeing more and more is this pro-capitalist, business-oriented feminism that's actually seeking to use gender as a way in which to re-embed kind of a more legitimate and supposedly equitable form of capitalism in the wake of the global financial crisis. So what I do in this paper are three specific things. And the first thing that I do is to try to outline this emerging project. And I've done this a little bit elsewhere as well. And, I, and I'm trying to highlight, again, these new knowledges that are being created by corporations in particular, but then they're being picked up by the United Nations, by the World Bank, by all these other institutions. So I'm looking at, at how these different corporations are actually constructing these knowledges about gender and the gender dimension of markets. And I argue that these knowledges provide an ideological underpinning for a project that seeks to extend and to deepen capitalism, especially financially driven forms of capitalist accumulation. And they seek to use gender as part of a narrative that both naturalizes and depoliticizes financial crises, presenting it as both a cause of and a way out of the crisis. And once I kind of outline this, this, what I understand to be this emerging project of transnational business feminism, I then outline a feminist historical materialist approach that allows us, I think, to develop an account of the gendered nature of capitalism and of finance that is much more repoliticized and, and rehistoricized. And then in the third section of my paper, I actually use this feminist historical materialist framework in order to critique this transnational business feminist project. It's really wordy, I know. Uh, as, as, and I argue that this is actually, that this transnational business feminist project is part of the ongoing primitive accumulation of capital that is driven forward by states and corporations that are seeking to draw women as, and here I quote, the world's most underutilized resource into capitalist relations of production and social reproduction. And I argue that this has the effect 
of reproducing the devaluation of women's commodified labor, uh, sorry, the devaluation of women's non-commodified labor. It seeks to deepen the exploitation of men and women through commodified forms of labor, and it's creating new forms of exploitation and dispossession through the deepening of financial relations. I'm probably not going to have time to do all this right now. But uh, to start with kind of this, this idea of transnational business feminism and the production of knowledge, I, I developed this term as a, as a play on, on transnational business masculinity, which is a concept that was developed by Connell and others, and it referred to a form of masculinity that came out of the crisis of male bread, breadwinner masculinity, which is kind of what Joanna was starting to talk about in her presentation. And so what Connell and, and other feminists had argued, and there's a lot of cultural feminists in particular who are doing kind of cultural approaches to IPE, they were arguing that this transnational business masculinity is characterized by egoism, by conditional loyalties, the exploitation and subordination of working class men in the global north and most of the people in the global south, and it's also characterized by gender discrimination that's justified as being the outcome of the invisible hand of the market. So in the years leading up to the 2008 global financial crisis, a number of feminists had documented this sort of behavior in various realms of, 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 of uh, capitalism, and particularly in the financial sphere. So you have these works that were starting to document the behavior of traders. It was argued that they're exuberating a masculinized energy, they're engaging in aggressive and sexualized behavior, and displaying a heterosexualized male confidence. And it was argued that all of these characteristics serve to disadvantage and discriminate against women and against anyone who was displaying any alternative form of masculinity at every level of the financial system. So then we have the global financial crisis, and I'm sure everyone remembers, in the wake of the financial crisis, you had a growing number of media pundits and academics and some government officials who started to pick up on this idea that the problem was this, this masculinized behavior that existed in the financial sphere. And at the same time, over the, you know, in the 2000s, so throughout that decade, a number of studies had been done by behavioralists who were arguing, who were claiming to be able to show that women tend to take fewer risks than men and that this may not negatively affect their financial performance. So maybe there's something about the feminine character, about feminine values, that's actually more profitable for finance in the long run. <laughs> so the argument then that, that came out of this was that the greater presence of women in finance would have helped to constrain this highly masculinized, risky, and speculative behavior of financial trains and firms, traders and firms. So what I argue comes out of this discourse then is that the cure for this errant masculinity that rendered the global financial system vulnerable to crisis was projected to be a healthy dose of femininity, which would then reestablish a rational and sustainable global financial system. So the cure for this transnational business masculinity is this transnational business feminism. That's where I come up with the concept. It's a long story, but that, that's what gets the concept. So in this framework then, women are central to reestablishing the legitimacy of global finance, while gender, which is framed as a cultural system that exists externally to financial markets, becomes an explanation for the improper functioning of markets. So again, here, the idea is that the crisis isn't structural. So it's, it's not what the Marxists are saying. It's not structurally rooted, but it's about culture. It's about gender, which is cultural. It exists outside of markets. And it's even tied to biological factors. So I look, for instance, at uh, Shimon and Kay, who authored a couple of books around what they're calling womenomics, which is a distinctly non-feminist, I would argue, uh, it, it, or maybe it's a liberal feminist approach to understanding, to having this women-centered approach to economics. And one of the things that they argue in this research is that they've uncovered what they're calling an asset to estrogen ratio. <laughs> I know, it's really good. So, so they, they suggest that greater number of women employed by companies leads to greater profits, or what they call pink profits. So if corporations have been <laughs> They've then latched onto this line of, of argument, and the incorporation so Goldman Sachs, for instance, has advanced its own line of womenomics research. So it's actually also saying it's part of this womenomics framework. And for Goldman Sachs, it's a little bit different. So here, womenomics is part of its investment strategy that seeks to identify those corporations that are best positioned to gain from women's rising rates of employment and their growing purchasing power. And you have companies, Deloitte, for instance, has this line of research on what it's calling the gender dividend. So it's looking at, again, the profits that can be made by investing in women. Uh, PricewaterhouseCooper, Ernst & Young, so all of these guys. And Nike has this entire uh, girl effect research. So these lines of research are then, they're, they're actually tied to philanthropic initiatives. So they're aiming to dedicate some amount of their profits to women, particularly women in the global south. But again, the idea being that investing in women is just good for everyone. And the financial crisis, again, becomes a pivotal moment for this discourse. 
So to quote Ernst & Young again, uh, the financial crisis jolting the world's economies only highlights the missing voices and lacking presence of women. A crisis presents an opportunity for change, and now is the time in history to realize and harness the power and positive effect of women's empowerment and leadership can have on the global economy. So women are going to solve the crisis that was created by this masculinized behavior. So anyway, I argue that in some ways this reflects some sort of success of, of liberal feminism, but at best, I mean, this is, this is a project that's totally uncritical of capitalism and the broader neoliberal macroeconomic frameworks that have created and sustained gender-based inequality and oppression, i.e. via the erosion of public supports for social reproduction, the global feminization of labor, and the protection of the rights of capital above and beyond those of the global, global poor. But ultimately, again, this project is using gender as an ahistorical and depoliticized explanation for capitalist crises, as well as the basis on which a more legitimate and sustainable capitalism can be created. So now that I've presented the problem, I have no time to give you the solution. Uh, which ultimately, what I argue, if, uh, feminist historical materialism, I'm arguing, is, is able to uh, draw attention to the ways in which gender is a social construction that is firmly and inseparably rooted in the historical development of capitalist society. And the latter uh, is, by its very nature, of commodity production and exchange not only necessarily exploitative, but also an equal. And I argue that capitalist society is also, like gender, neither natural nor an inevitable occurrence, but is rather socially constructed and normalized through class relations, the power of capitalist states, and social constructions of knowledge, such as those that I've outlined above. So in contrast to this transnational business feminism and its tendency to naturalize gender, I think the feminist historical materialist approach locates gender in the context of the development of capitalism. And here the story is quite familiar, and Joanna talked about it a little bit in her presentation. So we have the story of the separation of production and social reproduction and women becoming responsible for the latter. The work of social reproduction is devalued and rendered invisible, and ultimately women's association with this work then becomes a means of devaluing their paid labor. And the framing of women as untapped or underutilized resources, who by virtue of Western investments in their human capital can be transformed into so-called productive workers and consumers, reproduces this very same capitalist devaluation of women's labor. And I argue that at the same time, a feminist historical materialist perspective draws attention to the ways in which the wave of, social, of cuts to social services that have been done in the name of fiscal austerity in this post-crisis moment actually represent cuts to the social wave, uh, the social wage. Uh, so whereas transnational business feminism is rooted in a theory and a practice that seeks to put earnings in women's hands because it's supposedly the intelligent thing to do, a feminist historic materialist reading draws attention to the ways in which this shifts the responsibility away from states, it further individualizes the costs of social reproduction, and it devalues women's unpaid labor while simultaneously naturalizing their roles uh, within the realm of social reproduction. So moving into the third section of the paper then, what I argue is that within this broader context, the integration of women into gendered capitalist labor markets does not automatically translate into the economic empowerment of women, but it may rather deepen the exploitation of women and men, particularly through the new and highly disciplinary financial relations that are being extended as part of the transnational business feminism project. So I argue, for instance, that in, in the, the, how this is done kind of changes, but in the Global North, for instance, we've seen women integrated into this project through the extension of subprime mortgages, which were sold to kind of the public as being a, a means of, of empowering women. If we were to extend these mortgages to a greater number of women, we're giving them access to the financial, to the ability to accumulate assets in, in ways that they previously weren't able to do. Uh, but, but we know this story a little bit. It's, it's been it's been told by, by some people that these mortgages were actually highly discriminatory and women faced much higher uh, interest rates than men and, and as a result of the foreclosure crisis have lost uh, wealth overall relative to men. And in the global south, I argue, uh, these financial relations are being extended through the spread of microfinance, which has been going on for a long time, but in the wake of the 2008 crisis, it's been argued that microfinance is actually a, a viable investment alternative to today's turbulent market. So again, kind of post-crisis, it's been argued, uh, and there I was actually quoting Bill Clinton, who argued that investors should consider the poor of developing nations a viable investment alternative in today's turbulent market. So again, this is being sold as being a socially responsible investment that benefits investors and individuals alike. So what I do, in this paper and, and in other things that I've been trying to develop here is to actually look at these different initiatives that are being promoted by the Transnational Business Feminist Project and, and actually see that one of the things that they're doing is, is promoting the extension of microfinance companies and particularly for-profit microfinance companies 
uh, they're actually promoting uh, their, their further expansion in the global south. So I argue then that this is about the extension of uh, new capitalist relations of accumulation into spaces and relations that were previously shielded from the market. So I'm arguing that it's part of the ongoing primitive accumulation of capital. And we know from the work of Soviet Federici and others that historically this was a highly gendered process, and I'm arguing here that it's, it's gendered as well in its current manifestation. So, to conclude, while many critical and Marxist IP scholars have preferred to ignore gender, viewing these relations as somehow existing outside of the economic sphere and as something largely of concern to women and feminists, businesses have not been nearly so cavalier. Rather, gender has become an important terrain of mainstream debate regarding the future of capitalism. And this context provides an important opportunity then to develop historical materialism that takes gender seriously, as well as a feminism that is wedded to a materialist analysis that disrupts ahistorical and depoliticized approaches to gender. And returning to the quote that I opened with, after all, as Ernst and Young so aptly argued, the learning that comes from a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs>